that sounds quite unpleasant. Um, so there isn't, we have no definition of the inverse Laplace transform that I'm going to provide. The table is the only option for you to do this, okay? So if you want to do the inverse Laplace transform and you have this table, it, that's f of t if you can imagine. Yeah. It's very easy because if you have this entry here, the inverse Laplace transform is the corresponding f of t right there. Okay. So in other words, you can find in principle the uh, you can perform the Laplace transform of any function you want by applying the definition. The inverse has to be done only from the table. Okay. In this case, basically this is two entries in the table. There's the time domain function there's the corresponding Laplace transform. If you want to go the other direction, you need to go the other direction. You start here, you have to start here, and end up here. That's what the second line says. Okay. All right, so it just says you can go either direction. Okay, fine. All right, so the time delay is something people don't really understand immediately, um, and so it usually takes a little bit of time, but you'll get it. Okay, so let's play around with a little example. This is, a, this is an example you could easily solve using tools we had in 361. But I'll, I'll demonstrate it, and then I'll demonstrate a problem that you would have trouble solving in 361. Do you know, by the way, we're moving 361 to the software here? So, I don't know, I guess I've got to query you guys whether you like that. But our feeling was getting exposed to MATLAB and those things would be better earlier in the curriculum. So, just an FYI on that one. All right, so here's our differential equation, right? So linear, is it linear differential equation? Yes, good. It's got an initial condition, so we're going to solve this problem using the Laplace transform. How am I going to do this? I'm going to, first of all, apply the Laplace transform to the equation, okay, both sides of the equation. Okay. I've taken some liberties and, um, I guess, put a couple steps together, but first of all, I need to take the Laplace transform of this first term, right? This is a linear operator, so I can take the Laplace transform term by term and add up the results. Okay. I can pull the 5 out. I know you guys hate this. Don't hate me too much. Okay, I'm just applying that first thing, superposition. Okay. So apply Laplace transform to this equation term by term. So pull the 5 out and then take the Laplace transform of dy dt. I just told you that is s times Laplace transform of y minus the initial condition of y. That we derived that one. By. And that was the whole, this whole thing, integration by parts. Okay. We called it f then, now we're calling it y. It doesn't make any difference. Okay. Then you have plus 4 times the Laplace transform of y. I don't say these are y of t, but obviously y is the function of time. The Laplace transform of y of t is called y of s. Just the definition of what we mean by Laplace transform of y of t. Okay? And then I told you the Laplace transform of a constant like 2 is just that constant over s. Okay? So now I got this equation. That equation is wonderful because that's an algebraic equation in S now, right? What was a differential equation in, in um, Y is now an algebraic equation in, in capital Y. So this is the power of the Laplace transform here. Okay, <coughs> now I aspire to find Y of T. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression and I'm going to solve it for Y of S, right? Y of S appears there. And there, I'm going to plug in the initial condition 1 there. And then I'm going to rearrange this equation to have y of s on the left-hand side. I'm assuming this is just algebra now. Okay. Gather the terms involving y of s on the left-hand side and the terms not involving y of s on the right-hand side. And then solve for y of s, you'll get this. Okay. Just, it's just algebra at this point. Okay. okay, now I get this. So now is the bottleneck, right? Now I need y of t. Right? This doesn't do me any good, so this is great, but I need y of t back. If I can find y of t, I've solved the differential equation. Okay. So what I've done here in the first step is I already have my eyes on table 3.1, and I know entries like this don't appear in table 3.1. Okay. The kind of entries that appear in table 3.1 look like s plus a constant or tau s plus 1. So I have to make either that thing 1 or that thing 1 in these two terms. Okay, that's why I've chosen to rewrite it like this, because I know what's coming. Okay. So what have I done here? I've divided <coughs> uh, top and the bottom of the equation by 5. Right? And if you divide top and bottom by 5, you get that. All right. So now I want to find y of t. 
Y of t is the inverse Laplace transform of y of s, and y of s is that. So now I, I need to find that thing and something that looks like that in the table. Okay. Not surprising, the table doesn't have an entry that looks exactly like this. Okay. It has something that looks like this. Okay. Here's one of the entries in the table. It has this thing in the right-hand column. Okay. In other words, that's the f of s. And that tells you the corresponding f of t is that. I just took this right out of the table. Okay. The thing, yeah, table 3.1, unless they change the book, um, numbering. That's the f of s, and that's the corresponding f of t. How do I know I want this one? Because I know this one looks like the one I want. Okay. And in particular, this is what I have. This is what I want to find the inverse Laplace transform, and that's what the table tells me. So I can just identify for my particular problem that b1 is 0, the b2 is 0.8, and the b3 is 0.4. Okay, if you do that, that thing reduces to that thing. All right? So now that I know for my problem, I can use this formula, and I know the three b values, I can just say there's the answer, and just plug in the b values into that answer. Okay, that's all I've done here. Right? There's b3, there's b1, there's b2, there's b1, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And you end up with this particular answer. So one thing you'll notice about the answer is it involves two terms involving two exponential functions, and the exponential functions involve these two values in the numerator. That would be the denominator, b1 and b2. Okay. All right. And so once I plug in these b values here and here, I can find the coefficient. And this ends up evaluating the one half. E to the minus zero is the same as one. Okay, that's why I just get 0.5 there. And then this thing also values to 0.5 there. So there's the term there. So what does this function look like? Um, so this is a common thing I give you on the homework and the test. I have you find an answer like this, and then I ask you to draw it. Okay. Usually, you'll have a physical problem, so the actual solution, you know, should make sense. This is just a toy example, so there's no way to really interpret whether the solution makes sense or not. But you can certainly plot it. And so we've got y of t oops, versus time. First thing you might want to see when you have a solution like this is, does the initial condition, is this solution satisfy the initial condition? That would be good, right? So if you evaluate this at t equals 0, you get 1 half plus 1 half, which is 1, which is the initial condition I gave you. It doesn't prove it's right, but at least it's not wrong. Okay, that's certainly wrong. All right, so this guy looks like, um, I'm not sure why I'm calling these solutions these guys, but, okay. So it's going to start at 1 half, right, because if you evaluate that, um, that's smart. I just told you the initial condition was 1. It's going to start at 1, okay. And then it's going to decrease exponentially. And if you look at what this is for large values of time, right, the second term goes to zero, it ends up at one half. So it starts at one, it goes to one half, it decreases exponentially. So it looks, you know, like this. Right. Um, so when I, on a, if I'm on a test, it should ask methodically approach, you know, not the best drawing in the world. Um, one more. Okay, so if I ask you on a test or a homework, this is what I expect, just a sketch that looks something like that. Probably more legible. That would be good. Okay. All right, so that, that's easy enough. Um, so what happens if you end up in a situation where this thing is not in the table? Okay. So in other words, I want to take the inverse Laplace transform of something here, the y of s, and the y of s is not in the table. Then you have to break it into little pieces that are in the table. Doing something called partial fraction expansion. Do you remember that? OK. That's not that much fun. We'll talk about it. I try to avoid giving you problems that involve a lot of that, because it's just algebra. But you have to do it sometimes. I'll show you later how to do it. OK, so this is how we're going to go about solving these um, problems. So what this picture shows is what you do in the time domain and what you do in the Laplace domain. So the first thing you do is derive the model in the time domain. 
because that's the only way we know how to drive models, right? You'll get a differential equation or maybe more than one a differential equation. You might have one, two, three. I'll show you how to handle that later. At this point, we'll just say we have one. We have an initial condition for this differential equation. Then we take the Laplace transform, right? Just like we did. Then we aspire to solve this resulting algebraic equation for the dependent variable, which we'll call it y here. Just like we did before. Solve for y of s, you get a numerator and denominator. Okay? If all goes well, this thing on the right hand side will appear in the table in some form. Okay? And then you just take the inverse Laplace transform just by using the table. That'll be that'll be great. Okay? If life is not so nice, this thing will be too complex and won't appear in the table. Okay? So then what you have to do is break this thing down into smaller pieces that are on the table using something called partial fraction expansion. I'll show you how to do that later. Okay? For now, find differential equation or be given it. Take a Laplace transform, rearrange the algebraic equation for y, use the table to find the inverse Laplace transform, you're done. Okay? That's all you have to do. So I think that's all been covered in gory detail. Yes. Okay. Oh. Really? I thought we were going to do this some other time. Let's do it now. It's, it's, it's fun. Okay. So now I'm going to show you how to do the partial fraction expansion quickly. I think the book may pay more attention to it and have a lot of material, but I'm giving, I think I'm giving you three examples. They go from the reasonably simple to the, um, how do I say, unpleasantly complex, all right? So here's the reasonably simple one. Let's say you had this. Now, this is an example is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is actually in the table, but I'm trying to show you how to handle this, this case. So let's say you have this thing. You've done all the work. You've reduced the problem to taking the inverse Laplace transform of this, and you conclude that thing's not in the table. I think it is actually is, but, okay? What makes this problem easy compared to other problems is you can factor this denominator into two pieces, right? You can factor that into this, right? If I multiply that, I take that back. Okay, great. So now, if that thing wasn't in the table, I can do something called, a, this is the partial fraction expansion of this function. It looks like this, a constant. I don't know it, called alpha 1 over s plus 1 plus another constant, alpha 2, which I also don't know, and have to find over s plus 4. Okay? You can see the two things on the right are simpler than the thing on the left. So this is how it works. Now I have to find alpha 1 and alpha 2. Okay? Once I've done that, I can take the inverse Laplace transform of this thing instead of that thing, because they're equal to each other. The key thing when you do partial fraction expansion is make sure that you're doing it correctly and that the two sides can be equal to each other. Okay, that's why I would just go through an example. So this is an example where you can factor the denominator into distinct real roots. Okay, the roots being minus one and minus four in this case. All right, so there's many ways you could find um, these coefficients, but I would do the following. If I wanted to find alpha one, this, this um, equation has to hold for all values of s. Okay? So if I want to find alpha 1, what I'm going to do is multiply both sides of the equation by s plus 1. And then I'm going to set s equal minus 1. Because it has to hold at any value of s. Okay? If I multiply across by s plus 1, that will eliminate the s plus 1 there. This will be multiplied by s plus 1 and it will cancel the s plus 1 there. And if I set s equal minus 1, it will wipe that term out. Right? which is what I want, because I don't know alpha 2. Okay. So, and, and it, this thing is gone, right? So it'll be, it'll end up getting this thing here. Alpha 1 equals s plus 5 over s plus 4 evaluated at s equal minus 1. Okay, just, it's just a shortcut method. If you wanted to, you could pick two arbitrary values of s, generate two equations and two unknowns for alpha 1 and alpha 2, and solve them, and you get the same answer. It's just more work. So all I did to get this, multiply across by s plus 1, and then set s equal minus 1. If you do that, you find out alpha 1 is 4 thirds. All right. Well, <coughs> not surprisingly, to find alpha 2, we'll multiply across both sides of the equation by s plus 4, and set s equal minus 4. If you do that, you get this. Okay. If you evaluate, you get that's minus 1 third. Okay. So that means that function right there can be rewritten like this, where I plug in the value of alpha 1 and alpha 2. 
Okay, now if I look in the table, I will see there's an entry. That looks like the following. Let me make sure I don't screw it up. Okay. It looks something like this, I think. 1 over S plus B. Okay. It'll say, <laughs> it won't say it there though. It's a long column. 1 over S plus B. And over here it'll tell you the answer is E to the minus B T. Okay. So both those things look like that, right? They have things in the numerator that you don't care about because you can pull those out. So this is 1 over S plus 1. Right, so I get e to the minus b. In this case, it's minus b, so it's minus t. And then times the coefficient. And for the second term, uh, pull out the constant, which is minus 1 third. The b is 4, e to the minus 4t. So that's that simple. Okay. All right, so that one's, that one's pleasant um, compared to what we're about to do. Okay. So, okay, so that, that one's easy because it has roots in the denominator that are real and they're distinct, right? So what about this guy? So what makes this one a little more challenging? It has roots that are real too, but it has one that's repeated, right? It's got a root at minus 2 that's repeated twice. All right, so here's how you, first of all, do the partial fraction expansion. You have three terms, 1 over s plus 2, 1 over s plus 2 squared, and then 1 over this term. If this thing was to the 10th power, You'd have s plus 2, s plus 2 squared, s plus 2 cubed, s plus, you'd, have, you'd have 10 terms, okay? All right, so that, that seems okay so far. So what am I going to do now? Well, if I want to find alpha 2, first of all, I'm going to have trouble finding alpha 1 using the same procedure I did, right? Because if I multiply by s plus 2 and set s equal minus 2, I'm going to be dividing by 0 right there. That's going to be a problem. So I'm going to show you how to find alpha 1 in a minute. First of all, let's find alpha 2. How do you do that? Multiply both sides of the equation by s plus 2 squared and set s equal minus 2. That's this thing. If you evaluate that, you'll get 1 half. Okay. How do you find s? Multiply both sides of the equation by s and set s equal 0. Okay. If you do that, you get this. Bingo. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have alpha 1, and I don't have a good way to find it at this point. So. Um, what I'm going to do here is I know alpha 2 and I know alpha 3, so the only unknown is alpha 1, and that equation applies for any value of s. So I'm just going to pick a value of s, evaluate the left-hand side and the right-hand side. That will give me an equation for alpha 1, and I'll, I'll use it. Okay, you'll get the same answer no matter what value of s you choose. But some choices are more intelligent than others. Okay. And by far the most intelligent choice here is set s equal minus 1. So if I set s equal minus 1, the whole left-hand term will be 0. That will be nice. Right? This denominator here will be 1. This denominator here will be 1 squared. And that will be 1. That will be minus 1, actually. It doesn't get much easier than that. So you'll end up with an equation that looks like, if I'm not mistaken, 0 equals, where are we? Um, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 minus alpha 3. Okay, this is what happened when I took, set s equal minus 1 on both sides of the equation. So I know alpha 1, sorry, alpha 2, and I know alpha 3, so I can solve it for alpha 1, and if you do, you get the answer, which is 1 fourth, minus 1 fourth. Okay, looks good. So now instead of taking the Laplace transform of this one, which I think is actually not in the table this time, okay, I can take the Laplace transform of this thing with all the alphas now defined. Okay, so that was this. I set it to be this. Now I know the alphas. I plug them in. I get that thing. Now I'm going to take the inverse Laplace transform of that whole thing. Okay. Again, you have a, this term here. This generates a term that looks like e to the minus 2t multiplied times this coefficient minus 1 quarter. The other term is a little bit different because it's squared. So if you look in the Laplace transform, um, make sure I don't screw this one up, there's an entry that looks like this. Um, what the heck? 1 over, 1 over s plus b squared is t e to the minus bt. 
Okay. So the squared term generates a t out front here. All right. That's that's where I got this. It's not magic. Okay. So I pull the coefficient out. I take the Laplace transform of one over s plus b squared, where b is two, and I get e to the minus b t, and multiply that times t. Okay. And then again, I have this thing one fourth over s. We, and so we know the Laplace transform of a constant is 1 over s, so going the other direction, 1 over s is just a constant. This is probably confusing to you. Um, in, at this point, I'd be perfectly happy if you just wrote 1 quarter, but in the book, they commonly append on this step function. This is the thing that's not defined for time less than 0, and is 1 for time greater than n equal to 0. Okay. It has something to do with well-definedness. It doesn't really need to be used in step in the context when I do the time delay. So it would be fine if you just wrote one quarter. Okay. All right. Okay, well, that, that wasn't so bad. I think we'll all agree this isn't where we want to be, though. Okay. So maybe I should, rather than torment you unnecessarily, um, let me just give you the basic idea. Because I'm not likely to give you a problem that looks like this. You can see why. Just mindless algebra. Okay. But the, the result is somewhat interesting, as the first time we'll see something. So I'll, I'll focus on this solution, uh, uh, not so much of the procedure. But how would you do this? Okay, this is a nasty looking thing, right? This is not in the table. Okay. So you aspire to do a partial fraction expansion of this thing. So you have an S squared term, so you have a term over S, a term over S squared. And then you have this thing. That thing is not factorable into real roots. In fact, not in, yeah, right, they're complex. Okay. So I just leave that as it is in the numerator. I have to put a term that looks like alpha 3 s plus alpha 4. Now I have to find alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and alpha 4. Okay. How do I do it? Well, the book gives you two ways to do it. One way is the way I'm showing you. Another way is to do complex algebra. I don't really like complex algebra that much. I like real algebra. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by this denominator. And then I'm going to gather terms. So I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by s squared, and then that term in the denominator there. And then I'm going to gather powers of s. Okay. Okay. So we can see when I do that multiplication, I get s plus 1 there. I get, well, this is really going to get boring. Let's just go through the, you get the idea. I'm trying, well, I want to gather terms in s for reasons I'll explain in a minute. I'm going to multiply both sides by s squared and then this quadratic form here. And that will yield this. You can check out the details. It's not hard to see. It. I'll see it. Okay. Then I'm going to take this thing and gather all the terms, powers of s. Okay. There's cubed terms and squared terms and s terms and s to the zero terms, and I get this. Now, the thing is that now you might say, well, this is not very useful because this is one equation in four unknowns. But in reality, it's four equations in four unknowns because each one of these terms has to be zero by itself. Because you can't have a term that s cubed cancel a term that's s squared. Okay. If you want this thing to be equal to zero, that means this coefficient has to be zero, and this coefficient has to be zero, and that coefficient, so on and so forth. Okay, so I have four equations, four unknowns. Okay, they're easy to solve. Well, in this case, you're lucky, right? Because this first, this first thing is 5 alpha 2 minus 1. You can solve that for alpha 2, because it's equal to zero. Okay, solve for alpha 2. So now you can solve that one for alpha 1 by setting that thing equal to 0. And you easily solve the other two coefficients. And when you're all done, you'll end up with this. There is alpha 1, there is alpha 2, there is alpha 3, and there is alpha 4. Okay? It's just a bunch of algebra. It's not, it's not a core principle. It's a core principle of like, I don't know, junior high school? Is this when you do this kind of stuff? I was going to say elementary school, but that's probably a bit, a bit young. Okay. Um, all right. So, so this, so let's say now you've got this thing, okay? All right. Well, now you want to take the inverse Laplace transform of this thing. Well, it's easy to find the inverse Laplace transform of this thing, right? It's just a constant over s, which is just the constant. Don't worry about the s, like I just explained. Okay. Check. Okay. Constant over s squared. I can tell you, there's an entry in the in the table that says if this thing is s squared, this thing is t. The time domain function is t. That's where I get this thing, coefficient times time, OK? OK, now you get this thing, right? And this thing is not in the, doesn't look like that in the table, but something kind of looks like that in the table, OK? 
So what I'm forced to do at this point is play a game of rearrangement of this thing to look like two more functions that look in the table. You see, this is a never-ending quagmire of algebra. So I look at this thing and I say, oh, no. I don't have a term that looks like a, S plus B over something like this in the table.